All right, so welcome to tutorial part two. This is gonna be the first of three cockpit overviews. This one is just over the overhead panel. Next one will be the main panel, and then after that, the center pedestal. Uh, so we'll start, we have the aft overhead panel and the forward overhead panel. We'll start with the aft, and then we'll move to the forward, and we'll move left to right, and then top to bottom, left to right. Just kind of go over each panel, each switch, and give a brief description of the system associated and how they kind of work. We're not going to go full blown like ATP level detail here. It's just going to keep it real short and simple so that from a flight sim user or video game player, you have an idea of the gist of what all these switches are and what they do for you in the airplane. All right, so this is the aft overhead panel. Over here on the side, we have the leading edge devices position indicator. Um, you have leading edge flaps, which are the inner two, and then slats, which are the outer four. You have a little test button here to light it up. And if you look, you have amber, which would indicate that the devices are in transit. The next position is extended, leading edge flaps and slats. And then the third position is slats fully extended. So if you look, the leading edge flaps only have one position. And when these come out, flap settings one through five will deploy uh, the flaps and slats in their first position, and then any uh, flat position exceeding five will put the slats to their fully extended position. This is the IRS system. Basically, it's inertial guidance. Y you pre-position where it is, and then it keeps track of where you are using gyroscopes to kind of get an idea. It will drift slowly with time, although the rate at which it drifts is so slow that for the range of a 737, there's no real reason to try and update it in flight, although there is a way to do that it's practically there's no reason to really mess around with that um you basically set it there's a left and right set them both to nav they will power up and then begin aligning and then you have two little digital displays here and this knob is kind of controlling what you want shown track and ground speed lat long present position of where it thinks you are um it's guess on current winds based on your heading and ground track and then Heading or status. Status is nice because it'll show us minutes remaining for the IRS alignment. And then once it aligns, this will switch to show our current heading. Service info and pretty much always stays off. Here's our dome light, dim, off, bright. Jump seat audio control panel. We don't have a jump seater, it's a video game, so it, I don't know, it's, it's there. It works the same as every other audio control panel. Here are engine controls, the electric engine control units. Basically each Engine has one of these. It's not quite a FADEC, but it's, you know, close. And each one has two channels, the primary and the backup. If for some reason it senses a disagree or a failure, it'll switch to the backup, or you can open this up and manually switch it uh, to the backup channel. And then here are our reverser fail lights. If these came on, something's wrong with the thrust reverser logic. This is the pressure of the Crew O2 bottle. And this is our passenger oxygen control system. Normal, it will automatically deploy if the cabin pressure exceeds 14,000 feet. And then uh, on, you can open the guard and force it on and just manually drop the jungle yourself. Then we have an alternate gear indication lights here. We have the primary ones down by the gear handle, but for some reason, if you only got two green down there and the other one was dead and you looked up and saw three green here, that's still a valid gear indication. So these are just here redundantly as a backup. Here's our flight data recorder, has two positions, normal and test. Speed clacker or overspeed clacker test. You can make sure that the uh, overspeed enunciators are working. And then these are our shakers to test the shakers. All right, that's the aft overhead. Let's move on to the forward overhead. All right, so this is the flight control panel. Basically, the elevator ailerons and rudder of the 7.3 are all hydraulically controlled. However, in the event of a hydraulic failure of both the A and B systems, because the flight controls are powered by both systems, um, there is a mechanical linkage backup for the elevator and aileron, but not for the rudder. So basically the hydraulics, there's an A side and a B side, and they power different things, but they both power the flight controls. If you were to lose both systems, uh, you will lose hydraulics from the A or B to your flight controls. Now there is a mechanical backup for pitch and roll. However, yaw or rudder 
does not have a mechanical backup, so it actually has a standby hydraulic system dedicated for the standby rudder system. It's confusing. Anyways, if that turns on, the standby rudder, the, ru the standby rudder light right here, standby rudder on, will illuminate, telling you, hey, it's using the standby rudder. If we wanted to manually click it on, we could flip these switches up and turn on A or B or both, and basically force the standby rudder system to engage. We have low pressure lights right now on our flight controls, which makes sense because we don't have any hydraulic pressure right now because nothing's running. Down here we have spoiler masters. We can turn off the spoilers. It's a maintenance function pretty much. There's no reason to really ever do that. Then we have a yaw damper that will go on and stay on pretty much the entire flight. And here is our alternate flap system. So the flaps are controlled on the hydraulic B system. And in the event of a hydraulic B system failure, you would switch to an alternate flaps deploy system. Um, we can arm it by doing that, and then we use this switch right here to move the flaps up and down. Now a note is that the leading edge devices can be deployed with this alternate flap system. However, they will not retract. The trailing edge flaps will deploy and retract. It's pretty much that. Down here of the navigation panel, this is basically just redundancy for sources. If for some reason, if any of these were to have a failure on one side or the other, you can set du redundant duplications so that it'll copy from the other side. Here is our fuel panel. Um, so we got six pumps and basically three tanks, a cross feed valve, and then our uh, engine and spar valves. Let's talk about valves for a second. So the logic for Boeing valves is illuminated is the indicated position, which in this case is closed. Not illuminated would be the opposite of the indicated position, which for these would be open. And then bright is indicating that the valve is in transit. So for the cross feed, for example, if I open it, it's bright and then it goes dim. So it's opening and then it opened. It's closing, now it's closed. And that, that applies to any valve. Let's talk about this for a second. So the engines would be right here and here. You have a little diagram, right? The fuel pumps, right now I have this pump on because the APU is running, but let's, we can turn them all on. These kind of circulate the fuel and create a little bit of positive pressure to aid feed to the engine. Now, if these pumps were off, it will still gravity feed, but for more reliable feeding, we leave the pumps on. There is fuel in the center tank. The center tank is located in the fuselage between the wings between the forward and aft cargo compartments. When the center tank pumps are on, it forces fuel from the center tank to the wing tanks, and then from the wing tanks it goes to the engine. Center tank holds a lot more than the wing tanks do. We do not have the ability to transfer fuel from one side to the other. However, we can kind of mimic the effect by forcing where the fuel is fed from. So normally the left engine pulls fuel from the left wing and the right engine pulls fuel from the right wing and the center tank refills both wing tanks via the center tank pumps. So let's say the right tank had more, the right wing tank had more fuel in it than the left wing tank. What we could do is we could open the crossfeed valve, which now connects the two. Now this in itself won't do anything. It's still gonna flow normally. So then we have to create a pressure differential. So we'll turn off the low tank which reduces the pressure of this tank slightly. And because this one's higher, now the fuel in this tank will go through the cross feed and get to the engine. And this will cause this tank to burn down faster because now both engines are feeding off this tank. Once they're about equal again, we can turn the pumps back on and then close the cross feed. So here we have our kind of voltage and amperage indicator for both the DC and AC systems. Here we have our generator drives, which is kind of how the generators are connected to the engines to, to produce actual power. And then down here we have our electrical sources. So let's start at the top. This is the DC knob. It controls what these are displaying. So right now we have battery. I can switch to battery bus, standby power, aux battery if installed, or the TR, TR123. So if you look here around bat, Bat is selected, we have bat voltage, but no amperage. That's because we're on ground power. If I turn off the ground power, now we have battery discharge, and you can see we have a negative amperage being pulled from the battery. Here we have ground power, showing our frequency of ground power as well as voltage. 
and our APU generator, which is currently on and running. Uh, when this ground power available light comes on, it tells you that the ground power is available and also acceptable to the airplane. So it's not really necessary to come up here and check to make sure these numbers are correct. If this light is on, they are correct. So there's no need for you to, you to manually check it. Down here we have our battery master switch. And then here we have uh, cabin utility and IFE pass seat switches. So this goes to like the ovens and the uh, coffee makers and the galley and the labs and stuff like that. And then this goes to the seats, in-seat charging and entertainment system TVs, all that stuff. So that's what these two master switches go to. Down here we have the drive lights. These are on because the engines aren't running. If these were to come on with the engines running, it would tell us that the drive either uh, disconnected or overheated or something. Something caused the drive to fail and so that generator is no longer physically connected to the engine so it cannot be turning because the drive system has failed. We can also manually disconnect the generator from the engine with these guarded switches. We have standby power which will automatically kick into like a essential power mode where it reduces load and runs off the batteries. In auto it'll automatically do that if it detects a loss of electrical source or we can manually force it if for some reason it didn't in auto when it should have. Down here we have our sources, um, engine one, engine two, currently off bus, which makes sense because the engines aren't running. APU, which has a switch for both sides, a little confusing, we'll get back to that. And then the ground power. So, right now we're using the ground power. If I want to switch to the APU, I'll do this. This light went out because the APU is now on bus. This is still lit because the ground power is still available. If you look, we now have an amp draw from our APU. So let me go back to ground power. Available, not in use. Available and in use. Now this little source off light, basically what happened is this bus thought it was using ground power. That's the last thing we told it to do. And when I turn the APU on, this bus switch here, while it's powering both of them, this one lost its source and is now on a different source which means something went wrong and it's freaking out. So to fix it, we say, no, 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 it's okay. I want you on the APU, and then it's happy. So for some reason, if we were flying in flight and we lost our number two generator, that source off light would come on. It doesn't necessarily mean the bus is unpowered. It's probably still being powered via the bus transfer tie here from this engine, but it still comes on telling you, hey, I switched sources uncommanded. So something is probably wrong. So that's why the APU has two switches. Let's go back to ground power. I can power the right side. They're both powered, but this one's freaking out because it lost its source. And then I tell it it's okay. All right, one little trap here. With the APU powering everything, if you look, we got three blue lights and a dark light. And then our EGT gauge for the APU is hot because the APU is running. So if that's all you look at, there is a trap that you could think the APU is running when it's not. Now up here, we know for sure it's running and it's used. So now watch this. I'm going to go to ground power. And I'm going to turn off the APU. So now we still have our three blue lights. EGT is still hot because the APU was just running. But now if you look, we have two big zeros on our APU gen. <clears throat> so if I didn't look at this uh, ammeter, I might think that the APU is currently running and I'm using it and it's safe to disconnect ground power, but that's not the case. The APU is not running, even though all signs down here indicate that it could be. So that's why the most reliable way to tell if your APU is running is to actually look up and see if you're getting AC voltage and amperage from it. We've got our windshield wip wiper control for left and right. All right, panel backlighting. This controls the... Uh, Backlighting for the overhead panel, all the backlighting. <clears throat> circuit breaker bright is a floodlight that shines onto the circuit breakers. There's also two behind the seats. There's one. There's the other. Equipment cooling fans, these would live in normal. You can switch them to alternate if for some reason they stop working. This is the emergency lights. The emergency lights uh, illuminate areas uh, to help for evacuation. We'll come back to that when we go over all the other lights, but it basically has an off Closed is armed, or I can force them on. This was the smoking sign. It is now chime only because the smoking sign is always on. So there's three switch positions. Off, which is off for the seatbelt sign and doesn't do anything on this one. On, 
which is on and makes it chime something. Uh, and then auto. Auto is going to be on basically with the gear down. The gears down, it'll be on. We have a little uh, ground call button. Get attention of the rampers. Or we can call the flight attendants to let them know to pick up the phone and talk to us. If the flight attendants call us, this lights up. If the ground crew calls us, this light lights up. All right, here's our ignition. Um, don't be confused by left, right. That's not left and right engine. Each engine has two ignition systems, a left system and a right system. Typically, you'd run one or the other, and you'd alternate to wear them out evenly. But if it's really cold out and the engines are cold, you can use both. Here are actual start switches. So ground will initiate a start on the ground. Off has the ignition off. Continuous has the engines continuously sparking. You'd use this for takeoff, landing, uh, maybe heavy rain, when the icing system's on, or maybe heavy turbulence. And then flight would be for an in-flight restart if you had an in-flight flame out. You could that to flight and then just, you know, hope they relight. Let's talk about any ice and rain protection. We have windshield heat. There's also overheat, which will come on if it gets too hot. You can force it overheat to check the lights with that switch. And then you have to cycle them to clear it. Then we have our probe heat which in auto they'll turn on with the engines running. You can also turn them on manually. And then we have our engine lip ice and wing ice. So for the lip ice, to use it, you would first set the ignitions to continuous and then open them up. You would do this anytime you're in icing conditions, which would be the conditions in which ice can form. Visible moisture, less than 10 degrees centigrade, either on the ground taxiing for takeoff, landing, or in flight. And then you can also turn on the wing ice, which is to be used when there's actual ice. Not just the potential of getting ice, but you actually know you're picking it up. You'd turn that on. You can turn it on for taxi and in flight, but it should not be on for uh, takeoff. We have our hydraulic pumps. We have two mechanical pumps for the engines, which currently aren't producing pressure because the engines aren't running. And then two electrical pumps, which will produce hydraulic pressure electrically. If you looked, they're a little flip-flopped. System A has engine 1 and electric 2, whereas system B has electric 1 and engine 2. That way if we lost the right hand pumps, we'd still have a pump for each system. Here is our door indication. Any open doors will be illuminated here. Cockpit voice recorder. If you want to test, you can test it. Hold that light goes off, but it's a flight sim, so it doesn't really do anything. Here's our pressure gauge. There's two needles, a little tiny short needle and a long needle. The outer scale is pressure differential, PSI. The little one is actually cabin altitude. There's that, and then this is the rate of change. If the cabin altitude exceeds 10, you'll get the altitude uh, cabin warning horn will go off. And then if you're ever curious like what it should be kind of reading, down here you have a scale. So if we were flying at... Um, 26,000 feet, I'd expect to see it around 5,000 feet. Here's the air system. Basically for the 8900 when they made it longer, they introduced a third zone. So there's three zones, which is kind of weird because we only have two air conditioners. So that's the trim air system. The trim air system uh, basically looks at the three zones and the requested temperature for each. It runs the AC at the lowest requested air temperature between all three zones. And then after receiving the conditioned air in its own manifold, it will reintroduce hot bleed air to warm up the other zones to their desired temperatures. And so by using its a secondary manifold, it can cr artificially create three independent temperature zones from only two air conditioning sources. So here's where you would set the thermostat for those three zones. And then up here, you can check the temperatures. So we have the temperature of the supplied air from the cockpit portion of the manifold, supplied air from forward cabin and aft cabin, versus the temperature of the forward cabin and the aft cabin. And then we have the air coming straight out of the right pack and straight out of the left pack before it gets to the trim air system. We have two research fans, they pretty much stay in auto the whole time, and here's our duct pressure for the left side and right side of the pneumatics panel. Alright, this panel can be a little bit confusing, but if you kind of just take a second to think about it, 
whenever you try and manipulate it, it helps out a lot. So basically at the bottom you have your sources and at the top you have your packs. So engine two, APU bleed, engine one, left pack, right pack, and then an isolation valve which connects the two sides. The isolation valve has three positions, open, auto, and closed. Now closed is closed and open is open. So the question is what's auto? Auto will only open when there's an engine start that requires air to go from one side to the other, for example, starting the number two engine with APU bleed, the air has to get to the number two engine, so this will open for you. Or the second scenario is when any of the four corners are selected off. So two things just happened. Um, one, left side duct pressure is rising. If you look, the right side is down, and that's because this valve is closed, and we know it's closed because it's an auto, and all four corners are on. The other thing is we got the dual bleed light. Dual bleed is basically just warning us that we have two bleed sources on the same side. And the reason why it's warning us is if we had this engine running, if we were to move it out of idle thrust, the air off the engine is strong enough it could actually damage the APU. So with this light on, you really don't want to move the thrust levers out of idle provided the engine is running because this light does not know if the engine is running it just knows the switch positions so if i do that it is now happy wait no it's not what just happened well okay so what was in this scenario this valve's closed right as soon as i turned that off it opened because the corner's off so for a moment it was happy and then this valve opened and now it's unhappy again because this one is now connected to that one I turned them both off, now it's happy. Anyways, basically, long story short, if this light's on, just think about how the panel's set up and if there's actually a running engine attached to the APU. All right, and just for comparison, here is the pneumatics and air panel for the 700. So you can see it's a little bit different. We only have two air mix valves. They're a lot older looking. You have the actual positions shown here and then the temperature, and you only have two choices. You have supply duct, or the passenger cabin. Um, this panel down here is basically the same. We only have one recirc fan instead of two. That's that's really the only difference here. And then these switches, the auto is kind of like a thermostat. You uh, you set the temperature you want, and it tries to maintain it. Or you can flip it all the way over to manual down at the bottom. And then it's a press and hold. So if you Hold it to warm, it'll slowly open. Hold it to cold, it'll slowly close. And you can actually see the mix valve position. All right, and here's the pressure panel. We talked about the pressure gauges. You set your desired cruise altitude, you set your desired landing elevation, and it does the rest. Little note is if you never reach this altitude and then descend again, you will get the off-scheduled descent light. Basically, it's freaking out because you told it you were going to cruise at 21, and here we are descending, we never got to 21. So it's like, what the heck, man? And it's actually going to assume that you're returning to your departure airport, and it will then set up the cabin pressure to match the altitude of your departure airport. So if you don't set this to match your cruise altitude, then when you descend, it'll think you're returning to field which is a great function if you actually are returning to field because then you don't have to worry about resetting this panel. It's already going to go. But uh, if you're not, then that's a problem. So make sure that whenever you change your cruise altitude, change it up here as well to make it match. We have an auto mode, an alternate auto mode, and manual. In manual, you use these switches to physically control the outflow valve. So if I close the valve, it'll pressurize more. If I open the valve, it'll depressurize more. This is a bad day. We, we don't want to have to mess with that. So let's run through these really quick. So there's two sets of lights. You have the new lights and the old lights. These are the new lights. We'll do those first. So we have the landing lights, runway turnoff lights, which basically shine out to the sides so you can see your exits better. Taxi light. We have retractable landing lights. Middle position will extend them. Fully forward turns them on. Fixed landing lights. 
Run my turn off lights. Taxi light. The logo light. Position light steady. Strobe and steady. Anti collision. Wing inspection light. Shines on the leading edge so you can check for ice and damage at night. And then the wheel well light, which uh, basically is inside the gear well for pre flight. Doesn't really serve us at all in the flight sim. And then while we're at it, let's look at the emergency lights. They illuminate here, where the overwing exits would be, down here, where the slide would go, over here, where this slide would go, and then they also have one here for that slide. That is the overhead panel. Next one, uh, we'll do the MCP and main panel. Thanks for watching. Catch you on the next one.